Hello everyone and welcome to the 4th episode of the PowerShell video series. We are plowing through PowerShell and hopefully it's all making sense. In the last video we talked about reading from CSV files. And just before we dive into the topic for this video, let's quickly go over what exactly we did. We had a CSV file of students here and we wanted to add a new sum column to it with the sum of the maths and English score of each student. So we use import CSV to read in the data in the CSV file, and then we put that into a variable called students. Then, in order to actually add the maths and English from here, we converted them into numbers. So we take our students and use a for each to go through each item and set that item's math score to the math score, but as an int, whole number. And we then repeat that with the English. And now that the maths and the English are definitely numbers, we can add a new sum property to each student and put the correct thing into it. So yet again, we'll go through all the students and we'll go through each one, and then we'll use add member to add a new member, a new smaller part to the object. And the input object on that will be the current item like so, with the member type being note property, the name being sum, and for the value, we want it to be the maths plus the English. And if you'll recall from the last episode, this bit here needs to be in brackets. So it's very clear that we want to do this plus here, against these two and then use the result from that here which is different from without where we're basically saying run the command and then add the english score which makes no sense and that's what we did in the last video but as i mentioned right at the very end of the last video this is really long is there a way we can shorten this well, yeah, there are ways we can shorten this down, and I'm going to show you a few tricks we can use to make this a lot easier to write right now. The very first thing is an absolute lifesaver. One of the biggest problems we have here is we keep writing this for each here over and over again and honestly it's getting quite repetitive however there is actually an alias for for each called percent so instead of writing for each all the time we can actually just write percent and already that helps us out a lot it's much easier and i'll be using this from now on in the series Another problem is how long this add member is. I mean, look at all of this. But yet again, the PowerShell developers have thought of this. They're more than aware and have given us a few really nice shortcuts on this command. Firstly, instead of having to write dash input objects and all this, we can actually just pipe our object in. So we'll just do dollars underscore pipe into add member. That trims a lot of fat already. Is there anything else we can do? Well, you see, when add member was first introduced, one thing started to become very clear. About 95% of the time people were using it, they were using it to add a note property. People don't want any of the script properties and code properties. They almost always use this command to add note property. And that is why they added a parameter called note property members. And this parameter is fantastic. The way we use this parameter is instead of writing the member type, instead of writing the name, and instead of writing the value, we simply write dash note property members, and then we write this. Now, I'll explain what exactly this syntax is later on in the series, but for now, just stick with it. We're going to write an at sign followed by curly braces. And inside these curly braces, what we do is we write sum equals the maths plus the English. And that's it. I mean, you can't get shorter than this. We're adding some note property members, and it's called sum, and we're setting it to the maths and English. And what's great is you can actually add multiple note properties using this as well. As you'll see when we learn more about this app thing later on. And just by applying these things, our commands can be made considerably shorter. From now on, 
I'll definitely be using the percentage alias. Now then, as you've hopefully learnt by now, objects are perhaps the most central part of PowerShell. Everything is built around them, and as a result, there is a fair amount to them. They're literally the thing that makes PowerShell work, so of course there's quite a bit of stuff there. And because of this, in this video, I think it's time we dig deeper into objects. Now, I want to introduce something to you called types. When we have an object, that object always has a type attached to it. A type is essentially a description of what properties or what members an object must have. For example, when I run get process, this gives us a bunch of objects, and every single object it gives back are process info type of objects, meaning all those objects have the exact same properties on them, all the properties needed to represent processes. And almost every type we use is from these bits of the system. So the process info type would come from the .NET library, and the command info type would come from PowerShell's core. And every type is basically a definition of the members of the smaller parts a certain object has. So to sum it up, the type is essentially what kind of object we have, and therefore what properties and members that object must have on it. And to be clear, when I say it must have certain properties, I'm talking about regular properties. Note properties aren't attached to any type, and they can just be added to an object whenever you feel like it. Alright, so that's what types are. Every object follows some type. And in PowerShell, if we ever for some reason want to represent a type, as in actually refer to the literal type, what we do is we write square brackets and put the type in there. So let's say I wanted to reference the string type, which is the type for text objects. I just write square brackets and then put string in there. And there you go. It's given me an object that tells me all about the string type. Now hopefully you recognize this square bracket syntax from the last episode. How do we convert from a string text into a number? Well, if I put 1, 2, 3 into the variable s, to convert it, I get s, and then do square brackets int before it, where int is the type used to represent whole numbers. So this new knowledge about types actually explains a little bit what this is. We're taking what's in s, and then we're saying we want to treat it like it's the type int, which means it will convert from the string object it was, into an int object. And in the programming world, this actually has a bit of a fancy name to it. This is called casting, the idea of converting one kind of object into another. Don't ask me why we call it that, but that's what it's called. Now, of course, we can't cast everything. I couldn't just decide that I want to turn a single number, a single little integer, into an entire file object. That just doesn't make sense. How on earth is it supposed to make a file object out of just one number? So, you can't cast absolutely anything to anything, but that's casting. Turning an object from one type to another. Alright, cool, so that's what's going on with objects. Every single object has a certain type, and we can get information about that type by writing square brackets and putting the type's name inside them. And you can also use a similar thing for casting. Simply put the type in square brackets before something, and that will cast it from what it was into the new type you put there. Now, let's look at properties a little closer. Now, note properties are very straightforward. You can make them whenever you want, and you can put absolutely whatever type of object you want into them too. That's all there is to those. However, the regular built into the code properties are slightly different. Every normal property has two things. They have a name, which is what the property is called, and they also have a type. And this type is what type of object the property will have in it. For example, let's say I have a process info type of object, an object describing a process, and one of the properties it stores is the name of the process. And on that property, the type would be string, the type for a text object. And what that means is the property will only ever have a string type of object in it. It must have text in it. 
So with note properties, you can just put whatever type of object you want into it whenever you want. But with regular properties, they have restrictions allowing only specific types of objects in. This is actually a really good thing because it stops you from potentially doing stupid stuff like putting a number object into the name property of a file. And it means that all of the code inside .NET that works with file objects knows that there will always be a string object in that property. No problems. Alright, so that's all good. We have different types of objects for different things. And each different type of object is made up of different members. Members meaning all the smaller stuff in the object. We know two kinds of members you can get so far. We know about regular properties and note properties. However, as you know, these aren't the only members. There's script properties and code properties and all this other stuff that doesn't really matter too much. But there's one more kind of member that we need to know about. So far we've looked at the two kinds of properties you need to know about. And as you know, properties are the way we store data on an object. It's broken down into properties. However, objects don't just have to have data on them. Objects can also have code inside them. They can do certain actions and all of that code inside them is organized into things called methods aka functions. Think of a method like a command except you perform that command actually to a specific object. A method is essentially a block of code that does some action and we can run it. I think it's best if I show you an example. So let's say we have a file object that represents a file and inside it we'll have all of our properties as usual but we'll also have some methods, some actions we can take on the file. For example, deleting the file could be a method. When we run this method on one of our file objects, it will delete the file that object represents. Another example, what if we have an object that represents a process? What methods do you think we could put on there? What actions could you take on a process? Well, how about a kill method? We run this method on a certain process object and it will kill the process that object describes. Alright, so a method allows us to perform some action on a certain object. And just like properties, methods are shared across types. So every process object will always have the exact same methods and properties. Every file object will always have the exact same methods and properties and so on. And just like commands, methods can also have parameters on them. They can take in further details. And remember how properties are limited to only contain a specific type of object? Well, in a similar way, the parameters on methods are too. Let's say I have a rename method that takes in a new name parameter. That new name parameter would be set to only accept strings, only accept text, because the name is text. And in fact, this doesn't just apply to methods too. Commands and the parameters on commands are actually the same way too. Each of their parameters only accept certain types of objects. But the thing is, and the reason you probably haven't even noticed that these things are limited to specific types, is PowerShell actually does a really good job of automatically casting the objects whenever you try to put them into these parameters. So as an example, I was talking about the rename method taking in a string parameter earlier. If we were to, let's say, try to put a file object into that parameter, so I try to use some variable with a file object in it and use that as what to put in the new name parameter, PowerShell would automatically try to cast the file object into a string so it works. And what would that give us? If it tries to automatically turn my file object into a string so it fits into the parameter, what string do I get out of that? What does casting from file info to string give us? Well, let's find out. So I'm going to get all the files in this folder and I'm just going to take one of them. We'll get just that one using where. So where the name is exactly that. And there we are, there's that one object. And we'll put that one object 
into a variable called file. And now we're going to try and convert this file object into a string, just like this. And let's see what doing that gives us. And there we are. So when you convert from a file object to a string, we can see that the string it gives back is basically a path to that file, which makes sense. In fact, most of the time, that's exactly what you want it to turn into. For example, if we use get help to find out about import CSV for a second, we can actually see if we look here that the path parameter wants a string. This parameter on the command takes in only strings. Now let's say I do import CSV and for the path parameter, I don't give it text, but I give it my file object. If we do that, you'll notice it works perfectly. No error or anything. And the reason why it works perfectly is because PowerShell has automatically casted this file object into a string because it's seen, oh hey, this parameter here wants a string, but we're trying to give it a file object. So let's just try and turn that file object into a string. So it goes into the parameter. And when it did that converting, the string it turned into was just a path to the file, which is exactly what import CSV wanted. So that's fine. So essentially PowerShell is really good at casting between types automatically because it wants this stuff to get as little in your way as possible. However, even though PowerShell will work hard to do these things automatically and have them just work, it's still useful to actually understand what's really going on here, which is that a lot of these things are limited to only accept specific types of objects. And what happens is if you try to put in something that doesn't match that type, PowerShell will just try to turn it into that type of object for you. So methods take in things through their parameters and they can also give back things too, known as returning things, returning things back to us. And yet again, just like the parameters, every method will return a specific type of object. So we may get a string back or an integer back. It all depends on the method. Not every method will return something back to you, but it can. Again, just like with commands, commands can and usually do give back objects, but not all commands have to give back objects, and some will just do an action, and that's it. Alright, so I think that's enough of me going on about all this theory. How about we go back into PowerShell and actually use some of this? So, how about we actually run one of these methods? Now, I'm going to introduce you to a method called getType. This particular method is interesting because every single type of object in existence has this method. So no matter what object you have and what type it has, it will always have a getType method on it. And what this method does is it tells us about what type an object has. So. If I had a string object and I ran get type on it, it would give me information about the string type. This method has no parameters, so it doesn't take in anything, you just run it on the object. But it does give back return a type object. It has a bunch of properties describing a type. This is actually exactly the same type of object you get when you write a type's name in bracket. If you remember from earlier, if you want to find out about a type with a specific name, you write square brackets and put the type name inside those square brackets. And when you do that, when you write a type in square brackets without anything after it, because that would be casting, what this does is it gives you a type object telling you about the type you entered in the square brackets. So both of these things give you a type type of object telling you about a type. A lot of type in that sentence, I know. So if I have an object in variable O and I don't know what type it is, I can just run get type on it and find out. Get type will tell me exactly what type it is. Let me show you. So here we are within PowerShell and I'm going to make a new variable called S and I'm going to put a string inside it. The way we make a string is simply by writing quotes and putting whatever text we want inside. So let's say ABC. There we are, 
my variable s now has the string, the text, abc in it. Now, let's first see what we get when we write square brackets with string in the middle. So if I hit enter, here you'll see we get information about the type string. However, what if I have a variable like s and I don't know what type it has in it and I want to find out? What can I do then? Well, then we can run the getType method on our object, which will give back info about whatever type of object it is. So let's do that. Now, running methods is really similar to getting properties. We take our variable with the object we want to run the method on, then do a dot, and then write getType. However, there is just one thing we need at the end here to tell PowerShell that we want to run a method and not get a property. And that one thing is brackets, like so. These brackets at the end make it clear to PowerShell and to us too that we are running a method as opposed to getting a property. This is how it distinguishes between the two. So I'll do that, and since s contained a string type of object, getType is going to give back all the details about the string type. So this makes getType an excellent way to find out what type an object is. Let's say that here in a variable called file, I have one single file object. Now, what I want to know is, what actually is the type for file object called? What's the actual name of the file object type? Well, all we have to do is run getType on this object, and it will return back info about what type it is. So we'll take our file object and run the getType method on it. Ah, here we are, here's some information about the type, and if we look at the name here, we can see it's called file info. Cool, so that's what the type for file object is, it's called file info. So there we are, we just ran our first method. Well, this is the first method we ran ourselves at least. Inside PowerShell there are thousands being run. One thing I just want to say before we move on, throughout this video I've been saying we're going to run this method, or we ran this method. But there's actually a more specific word than that. For whatever reason, in the programming world, when we describe running a method, what we actually say is calling. So when you call a method, it means you're running that method. I don't know why in the programming world we call it that, but that's just what it's called. I'm actually not sorry. So let's get all the processes on the system, you know, as you do. And for each one of them, we're going to run the getType method. So for each one, we take the current object we're on and call getType. And just like getting properties, just like running commands, just like all of those, for each we'll take what the method returns each time and it will collect it all together. So if we have 10 process objects, it's going to call getType 10 times for each one and bring all the results from those together and we'll get 10 type objects back. Let's run it! And here we are. So it went through each object and called get type on them and this is the result from each one. So yeah, no surprise here. Every single one was a process because it's not exactly going to change. They're all process objects. Now let's just take a closer look at one of these type objects on their own. So, as we know, there are a few ways we can get them. We can go the square brackets way, like this. Or we can take something, like let's say a string, so a string with ABC in it, and then take that object and do dot get type. So we're taking our string from here and running get type on it. And here's the type object. A lot of these properties don't really matter, right? The property we're really interested in is the name. This is what the type is called. However, there are more properties actually, the table just isn't showing them. So we'll take the type object from here and we'll pipe it into format list. So we get a more complete list. And yeah, there are a lot of properties on here. It has basically everything you could ever want to know about a type. Like for example, the full name property near the top here. You see, this name property here is actually a shortened version of this. So we can see that the type is really called system.string. That's the full proper name for this type. But honestly, though, I'm not really going to look through this, okay? You're free to explore these as you want and take a look at what they have inside them. There's loads of stuff here. A lot of it probably won't even make sense right now, but some of it is some very, very complicated things that we just you just don't need to worry about. 
One thing that's quite nice is these type objects have a method called get properties, which will give us a list of all the properties in that type. So here I have a file object, and if I take this object and get the type of it, we'll see it's a file info. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this type, take the object this get type gives us, and I'm going to call the method get properties on it. So to break this apart, we take our object in the variable, then we call get type on it, and that will give us back a type object, and we then take that type object it gave back and run the get properties method on it. And let's just take this further and let's take these properties it gives us and pipe them into format table just so it shows them as a table and here we are here's a list of all the properties in the file info type so every file info type of object must have these properties on it so we can see there's a name there's an extension there's a last access time last write time and you can actually even if you go over here you can actually see what types these properties are, what type of objects they contain. So the name is a string, the extension is a string, we can see the last write time is a date time, because it's a date and a time, uh, so you can just sort of see the types that these are. And I think that's enough on types and methods of this video. But just before we close off the video, I want to talk about the difference between commands and methods. Let's say you have a file object, and you want to delete the file that object refers to. You can either pipe the object into the command remove item, which will delete the file, or you can also take the file object and call delete on it. Well, <laughs> which one should you do and why are there two ways to do this? Well, the answer to the first question of which one you should do is use the command. If there's a command available to do what you want, just use that command. It's there, it's been built specifically for PowerShell, so it's just going to be the easiest, best way. In fact, inside the command, it probably just goes and runs the method anyway. That's what the command does for you. So, if there's a command to do what you want, just use the command. However, there are a lot of things in the world, and the thing is, you can't have a dedicated PowerShell command for every single thing out there you could be doing. When you start to do more advanced things in PowerShell, sometimes you may not have a command to do it for you, and you need to go just a little deeper and start using the actual methods on the objects provided by .NET, as opposed to using the nicer commands which basically sit on top of those methods. So hopefully that slightly clears up why we have both commands and methods. Quite simply, the command is the thing designed specifically for PowerShell. It's made to be used in PowerShell, but if you start doing much more advanced things, you may need to use the methods instead. So that's all. So thank you for watching this video. The next video is basically part two of this video. We're going to take an even closer look at methods, we're going to take an even closer look at objects, we're going to take a closer look at types, we're just going to take a closer look at everything we've looked at here. So thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed. Man, you know, literally half that video was just improvised. I don't know why, I just improvised. Alright, well there we are, done.